So welcome to uh, the first Media Matters, um, second Media Matters of this semester. Uh, I'm Sharon Maxwell Magnus. I am uh, head of the media group and my guest today is Ryan Mason and I'll be telling you a little bit about Ryan uh, very shortly. Uh, first to say that uh, the media group hosts journalism, film, media cultures and digital media. So we provide uh, a real range of um, subjects. These can be done at undergraduate level, uh, can be done in various combinations. You can combine your media and your journalism. You can do mass communications. You can do journalism and creative writing, journalism and media. We've got a whole range of uh, degrees uh, with, and all of them feature cutting edge skills. Today, we're being joined also by our MA students who are on both the sports and magazine uh, strand, um, and also by some of our local sixth forms. Um, so we provide a very varied, very flexible diet, uh, as Ryan indeed benefited from the tutors here are both practitioners, uh, uh, Jonathan, I can see amongst us, for instance, is our radio expert with his own radio show. Philip, our magazine expert, also joining us today. So your tutors have a range of expertise covering a wide range of areas. As a tutor, one of the greatest things is seeing our students grow in confidence and belief in themselves. And that's why it gives me particular pleasure today to welcome Ryan Mason because Ryan is actually someone I've taught and that makes me feel very, very old. <laughs> and um, it was wonderful to see that during Ryan's time at the university, he really grew in confidence. He was someone who was often coming for one-to-one -one support sessions. He was doing really well, but he wanted to get that first. And he was determined to get it through getting any extra help that he needed. And indeed, Ryan, you came out with that first. I remember you saying on my first, on our first meeting, I really want to get a thirst. I really want to know how to do it. And you got that first in English language, in journalism, and in what was called digital publishing. Now we'd probably call digital media. Um, you've then gone on to a very successful career. Uh, your brand brand manager for Aways. I hope I pronounced that that right. Which is holiday rentals. So a difficult time at the morning. Um, but you've always had a passion for photography. As a journalism student, I remember you really enjoyed uh, the visual side of finding images to go with your uh, pieces, even when they weren't required. You had really good taste and you've always said how much you enjoyed photography. And indeed, I remember you telling me uh, as a student that you wanted your next piece to be on Norwich. And I said, well, what's there in Norwich? And you said that you want to write on. He said, well, the football club, you know. <laughs> so you're a great, passionate Norwich City supporter. So it wasn't a real surprise to me when um, to learn that you have founded your own football magazine uh, with a co-founder and that you're director of photography there. And that's really exciting because it's a print magazine. Uh, it's an independent and the future, I believe, of magazines belongs to people like Ryan, producing independence, magazines they love, magazines they want to work on, magazines they are personally invested in. So it's a beautiful, Glory is a beautiful publication. You have readers in 62 countries. It's an international publication. The future is international. Um, and those readers range from as far away as Qatar, Switzerland, and even Norwich. Uh, so that's, um, and it's growing even through the pandemic. So today Ryan's going to talk a bit about his own career journey. He's going to talk a bit about also how he set up the magazine and really be giving you tips if you're interested in your own media business and, and many people will be able to set up their own media businesses in the future. He'll be talking about how, um, how to do that. So it's going to be about half an hour for uh, talk. We'll have a, a presentation that'll hopefully work. I'll share in a minute. Um, and then time for questions. Uh, I'll, we'll be monitoring the chat. So if questions come in, we'll try and deal with them either during the session or towards the end. So uh, 
Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for coming back to your old university. It's, it's through hearing you were once sitting where these students were for a different set of speakers. So it's great to see you really returning the favour today. And at this point, shall I share screen? That'd be fantastic. Thank you. Great. Brilliant. There we go. It's a good start. Um, I thought I would lead with an image of a picture of me at university in my second year there with very, very long hair. Um, it's getting that way again with lockdown. Um, but um, no, thank you, everyone, for, for joining um, my chat. Um, thanks, Sharon, for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so firstly, I just kind of want to say, you know, with Media Matters, you're probably going to hear from a lot more, you know, inspirational people than myself, a lot more successful people than myself. But one thing I think that I really want to kind of talk to you guys about was I was, you know, in your position um, about 12 years ago. So I graduated from the University of Hertfordshire in 2008 um, with a first class honours in English language journalism and digital publishing. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of, you know, I, I've been in your position and, and, and tell you a little bit about my career to date. And, and as Sharon mentioned, I've gone on to kind of create my own publication with a, with a friend of mine, um, which, you know, it's still in early days, but it's, it's, it's got off the ground really, really well. And I want to share that journey with you. Um, so just to kind of talk around my university days a little bit. So like I said, I graduated in 2008. And one thing for me that I really, really wanted to do upon graduation was I wanted to stand out compared to other graduates when I graduated. So I knew I had to go above and beyond. Um, and whether that was speaking to Sharon about how do I get that first or whether it's about getting experience outside of university, I just I was hungry to kind of have that, you know, stand out, uh, it, it, uh, you know, to employers when, when coming out of university. So one thing I did in my third year was, um, I, as Sharon mentioned, I was very, very keen on photography and that's something that I, I've really got a passion for. Um, so actually I couldn't afford, you know, a camera at the time being a student. So I used to hire out the university camera at the, at the library, uh, the Haviland Library, and used to kind of uh, hire it out at the uh, start of the weekend and used to then go into London and just take pictures and kind of then, you know, whether that would support any kind of essays I was working on or anything. But that's when I really, really started to get into the photography side of things. And I, I and ever since that point, I really kind of developed my photography. And I can tell you a little bit more about that as I go on through this presentation. Um, but another thing that I started to do was actually I wanted to get some experience and, and marketing was an element that I was really interested in and it was kind of some so I had a gap year before I went to university and that was in a marketing kind of department so I, I knew I had an interest in that um, but I um, had a bit of a lucky break a friend of mine um, owned a shop in Norwich which is where I'm from um, he is a very very cool shop a clove shop sold really cool brands at the time um, and he used to do kind of band signings before um, gigs at the University of East Anglia. And there was this one American band called Medina Lake who were doing a, they were doing a signing. Um, and anyway, to cut the long story short, I went along, took some photos. And from that opportunity, I managed to get them to, um, the band were being sponsored by a clothing brand called Atticus Clothing, who were, who were founded by Blink-182. Um, and uh, I basically sent them some of my images and they loved them and started to use them as part of their promotional campaign. So I was like, obviously with that, I was absolutely buzzing. Um, and I thought, you know what, I can, I, I'll kind of build up a network and, and connection with them. So started talking to them, um, said I was at university, you know, and they said, well, we've got an opportunity for you to come, you know, work with, with us for a bit if you want and help out our marketing department. So that's exactly what I did, um, kind of one day a week during my third year. Obviously, it was a lot of work with all my third year work, but I wanted to really get that experience uh, under my belt as well. So I started to kind of go and work with them guys in Battersea uh, and just kind of start to get some experience and at the same time as working with the music and you know working with some really really cool bands and doing some really bespoke photo shoots I really started to kind of build up on this opportunity so come the end of university they actually offered me a full-time role so Sharon if you don't mind going on to the next slide that kind of starts me off in terms of my working journey. So I started off um, working with Atticus um, and I was only there, unfortunately, a few months. And there is a reason behind that and I'll get onto that. But during my time at Atticus, when I was working there full time, you know, I was working in marketing. Um, I was doing a lot of event stuff. So we'd have like a tent at all the main festivals, Reading Festival, Download, 
you know, all the big kind of rock festivals. And, you know, it's fantastic as a graduate coming out, kind of hanging out with all these bands, taking photos, you know, it was, it was amazing. Uh, it's a great, great experience. And then unfortunately the recession kicked in and that had obviously a massive impact um, in terms of a lot of businesses. And um, at the time I was being let off uh, by Atticus and I knew I had to kind of start afresh. So at this time being, a, you know, a, a very recent graduate living in London, um, I, I thought I need to kind of move home for a bit and I need to kind of get some further experience behind me to kind of really, you know, kind of get a bit more experience in marketing. Um, so I joined at Norwich Union at the time. So it's quite a transition from music to insurance, as you can imagine. But actually what was it was a massive opportunity for me because they were about to go through the rebrands from Norwich Union to Aviva, which was huge. You know, it was a massive big um, a blue chip company uh, and, and being a part of that brand team and, and being involved in that rebrand was fantastic. So that kind of gave me a couple of years experience doing that and getting some great experience behind me. Then I went agency side um, and I liked the fact, you know, that creative element to, to, the, to marketing and I wanted to get a bit of experience agency side and working on multiple brands. So I joined a, an agency called Bloom Dog. Um, they're called Crow Agency now, Crow with a K. Um, and I worked on brands such as Barclay Card, Starbucks, Mazda, um, you know, some fantastic brands working in the kind of Kent's department. Um, and that was great, you know, yet again, another fantastic experience for me. Um, but I just loved being part of a marketing team within a business. And a friend of mine um, was working at the music sales group. So going back into music, um, based in London, um, I took up a position as digital marketing manager, um, and they were the biggest distributor of sheet music and instruments online. So I was heading up their digital marketing, um, fantastic location just off Oxford Street, had a recording studio in their basement of the office. It was, it was fantastic, you know, enabled me to get some great knowledge in terms of digital marketing, especially. And then I was there for about three years. And then, you know, I got to an age where, you know, I was commuting from Norwich to London for that work and, you know, I wanted to start a family um, and I, I was looking, I was looking to move back closer to home again where all my family and friends were. So I made the transition back here in, into Norfolk and uh, it leads me to where I am now, which is Away. So Away is uh, the group parent company of some of the big self-catering holiday brands. So Ho Seasons, um, Cottages.com, James Villas. Um, Nova Sol, Land or Green Park, so a lot of these big European domestic holiday brands. So that's where I am now. I head up brand for, for, for a ways. Um, I've been there for six years nearly, um, and that's been great. You know, uh, it's gained me a lot of experience in terms of brand marketing. They've put a lot of faith in me, and um, and I've really grown as I think a marketeer since I've been there. And uh, you know, having I ended up having, uh, and I got four-year-old twin girls. So as you can imagine, it's, it's nice to have that kind of stability. But as a part of that kind of career journey, you know, I've always had that visual and creativity and entre entrepreneurialism. And um, so I was freelancing a lot towards the, the start of my career um, in photography. So I was working with the likes of Caterham F1, Soccer Bible, Rock Sound and Music. So a lot of these brands, you know, across lots of different um, areas um, and that's where kind of my, you know, I really want to continue growing my photography and, and that side of the business. And then towards the end kind of um, leads me on to kind of my next phase. So during that transition from moving from London to Norwich, I, I found it as a, like an opportunity. I was, I, was, I was a little bit frustrated because I felt as if, you know, I was kind of losing my integrity a little bit in terms of I felt as if I was you know, losing that creativity. And I wanted something that I could really own and take some of my skills that I'd learned at un um, university through the photography, take some skills that I'd learned through my digital publishing side, from my journalism side, but also some of those marketing skills that I developed through my, through my career. So it was, if you don't mind going to the next slide, Sharon, um, it, this is a bit of a random one, but this is where it all started. And I love train journeys for me. They're the perfect opportunity for, you know, sitting down and letting, you know, my mind go wild and kind of putting, jotting ideas on paper and just kind of coming up with new ideas. And it was actually the 5 p.m. train from London to Norwich that I came up with this idea around um, a football travel and culture brands. And um, 
I just felt I was an avid magazine reader. So during my time in London, I used to go into Soho, which was near my office. And I used to go to the specialist uh, news agents and magazine shop, which sold, you know, every magazine you could think of, the high end fashion magazines, architecture, sport, everything. And there was this one magazine in particular I used to like to get. Um, I was a few football magazines I used to like to get. And that kind of gave me this idea. So this magazine was called Serial Magazine, which was a it's, it's evolved slightly since I started to buy it. It was all around kind of lifestyle travel. It was a beautiful publication, really high end. The photography was incredible. And obviously at the same time as buying all these football magazines, that gave me this idea in terms of looking, you know, I really wanted to find a niche, something that could stand out in the market and, and, and hold, hold its own. And so I kind of thought, hang on a minute, you know, taking this beautiful lifestyle travel magazine and taking this kind of football magazine, actually, there's a, an opportunity here in terms of creating this beautiful football travel niche magazine and something that focuses on football across the globe um, and, and really, you know, being able to tell stories and stuff. So ultimately, I started just jotting down all these notes on this train journey. And I thought when I came to the end of it, I was like, I just... I really believe in this, you know, I, th I think there's something in it. So I reached out to a friend of mine called Lee Nash, who's a, who's a creative director. He runs his own um, creative studio. Um, and I just, uh, I reached out to him and said, look, mate, I've got this idea. I don't know if it's any good, but I just want to bounce it off you to see what you think. Um, so anyway, I sold him the idea, told him like, you know, around this kind of magazine, high-end publication and stuff like that. And he loved it. And I'd say within a week, you know, we were, we were together, we were going through ideas and kind of putting the foundations together about what it was and what, what, the, what, you know, what the name should be and what the ethos of it should be, which kind of, kind of the under, the underlying ethos for us was like, you know, putting the beautiful back into the beautiful game, you know, by putting, creating a beautiful publication dedicated to the beautiful game. And that was kind of like the underlying kind of tone of it. And, we, you know, using my skill sets as a photographer and with, you know, doing journalism and Lee's kind of skill sets in terms of graphic design and being a creative director, you know, suddenly we kind of, we could use our own skill sets here and, and, and do a lot of the work ourselves. But one thing we were really lacking was, it was writing. So there was a friend of a friend we got recommended who was also a massive football fan. Um, obviously I could do a bit of writing, but I wanted to kind of, you know, you know, get somebody else on board who, who could think of it that way. So we, we got a guy called Louis on board um, as a writer. So we had three of us, you know, of all different skill sets that could get us off the ground. Um, so if you don't mind going to the next slide, thanks, Sharon. So that kind of then was the start of glory. Um, and a lot of questions I get asked are, why glory? You know, why why this name? And, and for me, that is what kind of encapsulated what sport was all about and what life was all about. You know, everyone wants to kind of seek glory and whether it's you support a team, you support that team and you want the best from that team. Um, and, you know, when when traveling, you know, how, it, how good it makes you feel and experiencing different cultures, you know, and how amazing that feels. So we kind of got set on this glory and then Lee worked on this kind of, kind of the identity to it. So as you can see there, this, the, this, the, the line through the, the, the O was, you know, represents, you know, the halfway line of the football pitch, but also kind of represents a kind of a compass. And if you visit our website, um, you'll see we've kind of animated that to kind of sh show that. So we, there we were, we, we've got our kind of branding. We knew what we kind of stood for. Um, so it was a case of them building on that and going, okay, what's the branding behind it? How are we going to start this off? How are we going to sell this into people? How are we going to, you know, get our first experience and create our first publication? Um, and one thing we really want to do was we want this to enable us to, you know, use our skill sets, but also enable us to travel and experience football and different cultures for ourselves. So I'd say that's one thing that's unique about our magazine is we actually go and visit the places that we go to and we want to get a better understanding of football culture and experience it for ourselves and get, you know, that then makes it very easy for us to kind of pull the, the, the magazine together. Um, at the same time, you know, it feels like, you know, we, we're having a great experience, you know, we're watching football, we're, you know, traveling and, and I'm getting to do what I love, which is taking photos and, and, and documentary photography. So how do we start, you know, how do we start with all this? So 
And we were thinking, well, where's the perfect first destination? Where can we go? We've got anywhere to pick in the world, but we need that kind of, you know, that, that one destination. Um, so if you don't mind going to the next slide, thanks, Sharon. That kind of, you know, we, we kind of looked across, you know, we, we knew based on, we, we didn't have much money to put into it. You know, we were all had families and stuff and we're like, well, well, how can we get this off the ground? And we knew we couldn't go too far. But we came across the Faroe Islands. Now, the Faroe Islands, um, if, you, if you're not aware, is a group of um, islands in, in the North Atlantic between Iceland and Norway, um, north of Scotland. And it was incredible. We were just kind of researching and the Faroe Islands had just beaten Greece um, in, a, in a qualifier. And it was a massive like David versus Goliath moment. Um, you know, Faroe Islands is, is very small minnows of international football had beaten Greece who you know were the European champions only you know a few years back um and it was like it, that stood out to us and going how you know how is this small tiny island you know how have they gone on to beat this this massive you know country and so we we kind of delved into the Faroe Islands and the more we research and, and a lot of research goes into each destination we were kind of going okay this place looks incredible you know photography wise as visually it's going to look amazing you know the more we are researching about the stadiums and different pitches the more we are researching about football culture in, in the Faroe Islands it kind of all ticked all the boxes so we're like right okay well we're set on this is the destination we want to go to how do we go about going there and and so we kind of just for me networking is there's a massive thing so you know we networking has proved to be really significant in terms of our journey with glory and so we kind of used linkedin to our advantage um and uh, we contacted the tourist boards um, and members of the tourist board of the faroe islands and um we got speaking to a guy called levy hansen and and levy was i think head of tourism at the faroe islands and I'm a firm believer that lucky breaks play a, a very big part in, in this as well. So Levy happened to be a former international footballer for the Faroe Islands. Um, he was still playing domestic football in the Faroe Islands, as well as his job as part of the tourist board. So for us, you know, speaking to somebody who loves football um, and got the philosophy, you know, we just knew that all we needed to do is get across what we were trying to achieve and, and what we'd be producing at the end of it. And we were so lucky that Levy completely got it. He, he loved the concept. He loved what we were trying to do. Um, and he really wanted to help. And, you know, he's, he's become a real friend of ours, you know, because without Levy and his belief in what we were trying to achieve, who knows whether we'd, we'd have ever got glory off the ground and, and, and going for it. So we managed to speak to Levy and go, you know, there's obviously tour, tourism opportunities here, you know, looking at the Faroe Islands, not just from a you know, beautiful destination, but, you know, for people and um, a community of ground hoppers who potentially want to consider going there. So <clears throat> he um, basically helped fund our, 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 um, our trip. So they, you know, the accommodation, the travel uh, and the hire car. Um, and basically that enabled us to kind of start that journey. Um, so within, uh, it was literally weeks, within about three or four weeks, we found ourselves from having this idea to being in the Faroe Islands and I, there were moments whilst we were there we were like having to kind of nip ourselves to kind of go is this real like have we really taken this idea that from a train journey that we're now actually starting this journey um, and so there we were in the Faroe Islands for four days traveling around these set, set of islands um, photographing the most stunning landscape um, you know as you can see here on this on this image itself this is on the very north of the Faroe Islands a place called Eide where this, you know, managed to get high and shoot this amazing pitch surrounded by fjords. And, you know, and, and it seems on the photo as if the community is built around the football pitch. So for me, from a visual aspect, it was, it was perfect. And it was great. You know, we got to speak to locals, talk to, um, talk to people who lived there and how much football meant to them and what teams they followed and, you know, and, and how easy it was to travel around the islands to kind of go and follow their team. Um, and it, it was a great experience. We, we managed to catch an international match while we were there, got friendly with the, the fan group called Skansen, and they basically took us in as one of their own, you know, and we got a, a great set of portraits. Um, and so that was the start of the journey, but we knew that the, the real work was when we got, we got home and that, that we had to pull this publication together um, and, and kind of justify 
the trip there and, and what we were trying to achieve. So going on to the next slide, this was our first issue of Glory. Um, and, you know, how do we now market this product? You know, we've gone on this trip. We've now got a publication and we knew that was always important in order to kind of grow the brand and grow what Look Glory was all about, that we needed that first product to show to future destinations. Um, so there it was, Glory was born and, and we had that first publication and ultimately it grew rapidly through social media. Um, we didn't put any budget behind kind of growing it. It was just word of mouth and the power of social media then took, took over. Um, and, um, you know, it started to get traction because it was this new niche type of publication in the football space. Um, but also what we really want to achieve is to act as a bit of a travel guide. So with each publication that we do, we have a where to eat, where to stay, kind of what to wear. And they kind of are the fundamentals behind the, 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 the magazine as well. It's not just a football publication. It kind of crosses over with travel and culture a lot as well. So, you know, where, you know, if anyone who's interested in going to the Faroe Islands and has a love of football, we're kind of, you know, giving a recommendation on where should you stay and, uh, and you know, what brands to look out for whilst there and, and what you should eat and, and things like that. So it, it's, it's a kind of a multi kind of publication to kind of assist anyone in terms of traveling as well. So we felt as if we had a niche product and yeah, it, it, it started to kind of gain some traction um, and, and that was great, but we knew that we had to, we couldn't rest on our laurels. We knew we had to kind of build on this and <clears throat> pick a, a, the next destination and kind of ride that wave that we were kind of getting. So that kind of led us on to, right, well, where next? And this is where it kind of gets exciting about Glory is because, you know, we can pick anywhere in the world, you know, and, and as long as there's kind of stories there and as long as we can get some assistance in terms of helping us, then, you know, that we would look into the opportunities anywhere. So, for us, it was all around kind of the storytelling as well. So when we got to start to work on the second issue, it was right, well, what's being talked about at this moment in the football world that could, you know, um, you know, enlighten uh, readers. And um, and for us, it's all around that, that storytelling as well. Um, it, that's really important, you know, that journalistic aspect of it and telling some stories. And, and one thing around Glory wanted to do is, focus on destinations that don't get the spotlight so the likes of the premier league or la liga or the bundesliga we want to kind of go at you know places that don't get that limelight and and don't have you know aren't people aren't aware of the, the domestic football leagues there so <clears throat> that kind of led us on to our next issue so if you don't mind going on to the next one Sharon, which was kosovo so obviously um with kosovo at that time in terms of us looking for a next destination uh, they had they'd just been accepted into um, UEFA and FIFA, and that was a kind of a kind of monumental moment um, in football. And um, obviously, everyone kind of knows Kosovo as being kind of like this war torn country and and having the, this war. Um, so for us, it was a really strong. It's gone from the Faroe Islands, which was very very visual, to this you know Kosovo, which is a lot about the storytelling uh, of it. And um, and for us, that was really really important because. You know, we want to kind of, for us to go to Kosovo, there was so many stories there. Nobody knew what the domestic football league was like there and, you know, what teams played there and, you know, what players were coming through. And there was this, you know, suddenly Kosovo were going to be in, on the international football stage and there was very little knowledge about, you know, what players were coming through. So for us, this was a massive opportunity in terms of being the brand to go there and experience football in Kosovo and, and telling the story. Um, so <clears throat> yet again, in October, 2016, we found ourselves in Kosovo um, and, and traveling around and, and meeting some fantastic people. And we managed to capture a, a kind of a moment in history as well, as we went to their first ever um, World Cup qualifier. Um, it wasn't played in Kosovo, it was played in Albania because they didn't have a FIFA recognized international stadium. They were building an international stadium there, um, but they, they didn't have anyone recognized. So we traveled into Albania to then witness this game against Croatia, which was, you know, for us, yet again, another monumental moment in terms of the glory journey, you know, witnessing history and being able to document on that. Um, so that was, that was how, you know, the Kosovo um, issue came about. Um, and yeah, again, at 
we've gone, like I said, from the, this very visual Faroe Islands, this very strong storytelling piece. So that gave us a bit of insight in terms of what our readers were interested in. And, and that certainly gave us, yet again, some more credibility in, in, the, in that market to kind of storytell, but as well as create, you know, something visual. And then it kind of moved on um, then from Kosovo to look at our next destination. So from this and starting to build up a, a brand, you know, we started to get contacts in, in the world of sports. So <clears throat> we Puma were, were very much interested in terms of what we were doing. Um, they loved what we were doing and they, they wanted to help us in any way they possibly could. So we were like, well, we're looking for our next destination. Here's a few <clears throat> areas we're looking at. Um, and, and Sweden was next. Um, and there was a lot around <clears throat> Ibrahimovic at the time and his move and how he was this, you know, striker on the core stage and how he was, you know, really leading the Swedish national team. So for us, that was a, a really nice story there um, to tell. Also, you know, obviously Sweden, I'm a massive fan of Scandinavian design. So Sweden being um, part of Scandinavia and, and, and kind of, you know, there was this kind kind of design element we wanted to kind of you know get across as well um so as you see on the front cover there they had some beautifully designed architecturally stadiums that we kind of want to capture differently um and what puma enabled us to do is you know it's not about monetary uh, value that you know puma just wanted to assist us in terms of giving us access and that's one one of the biggest things that we we wanted really was to get that open door and that opportunity into clubs and into players. And, you know, being a couple of guys from Norwich who just love football and travel, trying to get that, you know, that, that open door was, was, was tough. Um, and we needed like the likes of these big brands to be able to do that for us. So Puma assisted in that. So they gave us access to players to interview. They gave us um, access to clubs they were affiliated with. So, um, you know, we, we visited Malmo, which is one of the most successful teams in, in Sweden, done a great piece um, on, on Malmo. And that's another section that we have within our magazine is a club focus and telling stories about a specific club. Um, and and that, that's why we visited Malmo. And then we traveled across to Stockholm. Um, yeah, and basically just got to meet some great people yet again and tell some incredible stories uh, about you know some teams as well that don't have the credibility but have got some fantastic stories behind them so that's why we then ventured to Sweden and that was our first kind of opportunity in terms of a partnership partnering with a, a sports brand and 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 gave us you know an insight into creating content affiliated and, and the partners and opening doors for us really and then it kind of led then to due to some personal circumstances I couldn't travel so far so but we still wanted to kind of get an, an issue out so um, we wanted to kind of stay a bit closer to home so that led us then on to our island issue and with Ireland we kind of wanted to yeah again <clears throat> that beautiful destination especially there on the on the west coast of Ireland which was made the cover of our, of our story but you know, with it being so close to home, not many people are aware of, you know, the, the, the domestic league in Ireland. Um, and so we want to kind of really focus on that, tell the stories, you know, of the fans of that domestic league. Um, we visited this club on, on the west coast um, of Ireland called Akil Rovers, who are based on Akil Island, which is a small island just off um, the west coast of Ireland. And yet again, it was, it was incredible, um, uh, you know, scenery and to hear about you know how these clubs are established and how they you know get players and you know they had an incredible story about um you know this was a, a team playing at a very low level in Irish football however they had um, a, a former Cameroonian World Cup international player playing for them so that in itself was what an incredible story like how did that come about and you know telling that that story was you know and for me that's what really makes what our publication is about is telling those stories not many people kind of know about so there we were in Ireland you know we got to travel around Ireland witnessing um you know Dundalk who were the champions at the time playing Cork who were, who were pushing for the title you know it's great atmosphere and just giving that insight and, and the passion of the Irish fans for for their game um was 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 brilliant um and really good and it's been one of our most popular issues today and I think you know, the, um, what, what we find is, um, you know, the Irish fans loved it, that we were, you know, doing a, a, a football mag magazine dedicated to their 
to their country and um, that, that's what we what we did there so we worked very closely with the um, Irish FA um, that, that they gave us access to you know clubs and, and helped us do interviews and and, and this is now where we're starting to kind of build you know some kind of partnerships and and you know as you can kind of see and uh, during our journey is we're still a very visual uh, magazine but for us it's the combination of visual and, and storytelling and that's where we're kind of starting to kind of push our push our publication but one thing we also tried to do is with each publication is have some kind of design trait that really stands out so for this issue for example uh, um, i don't know if you can see on one of those small images there's a little publication that we kind of published on the inside which was um, a fan of bohemians done a um, a poem he was a poet and he would write poems on his club and the success of his club and we, we found that's you know so beautiful that we want to really pull that out in terms of the publication in itself um, so as a little insert that we create and this is what we're trying to do as well as you know our readers love the fact that we do something a little bit of a design tweak or something just a little bit special and different with each issue that we do um, so then, yeah, yet again, we, we can look at then future opportunities and then Switzerland, yet again, another beautiful landscape. Um, uh, you know, we kind of, we traveled into Liechtenstein and, and there's uh, FC Fadus who play in this, um, the Swiss league because they don't have their own domestic league, but love kind of documenting the, you know, the Swiss club that aren't Swiss. And we played on that and, and documented them as a club focus. There's a, we came across a story around a mountain league. So um, in the mountains, there's this pitch, which is really, really famous, the Otmar Hitzfeld um, Stadium. Um, and it's, it's literally this pitch in the mountains between Switzerland and Italy. And they have this tournament every year and, and uh, this mountain league. And that made the cover of our, our issue because for us, that was, you know, that was incredible, you know, to find this dom small domestic league um, was 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 amazing and um, we got to interview Roy Hodgson who's a former international manager and obviously the, the, the manager of Crystal Palace so it was great to get his insight in terms of Swiss football um, and so yeah 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 again another great opportunity there and what we're starting to do here is bring in other creatives in terms of the process so we brought in um, a really well-known illustrator um, to work on you can see in the top right there um, to work on a piece for us um, so yeah, yet again, another great place to visit. But at this stage, we kind of were aware that we were, we were going to a lot of European destinations and we knew at some point that we needed to venture further afar. And that was always the, the, what we were trying to achieve with, with Glory is actually we need to go you know, beyond Europe. But as a small brand and small publication, you know, that was a, that was a big step. Um, so we needed to wait for the right moment for that. So between then, you know, we were starting to obviously we're doing these these issues, and then we 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 came up with this other publication, which leads on to the next slide. Thanks, Sharon. Which is, um, oh sorry, the next one. Sorry, I've got the order up the wrong wrong way round. So we we decided to release a mini publication um, in between um, our next destination, and this was this kind of was another idea around. Well, actually, can we document a unique and historic event or a massive game and actually have like 48 hours in a, a specific city? Um, and through our kind of connections with Norris City Football Club um, and obviously their star striker, Timu Puki, um, who is a massive icon, uh, you know, in Norwich, but also in Finland for their national team. We were aware of this massive game that was happening. Um, Finland could qualify for their first ever um first ever um, you know tournament um uh, and so we we saw the opportunity to go over to helsinki and actually witness and document this moment in history and so they were playing Liechtenstein, and if they got a draw anything better than a draw then they would qualify for their first ever major tournament so for us it was like great you know this is fantastic opportunity for us to release a new publication but it being just based on a specific event so we created a mini publication of glory um, and we call it our city stories um, and we've only managed so far to do one um, uh, you know with covid hitting and stuff we did plan on a lot more but we will be picking that back up again but that was great because it allowed us to tell the story from kind of the very start of the day 
to that evening game and and kind of you know what it meant to the people and 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 kind of bring that out visually and as a very visual publication in terms of telling that that story and and that was really popular especially with Finnish fans you know for them it was a massive iconic moment in history that if we could create a publication that documents that then you know they've got there's a keepsake there to kind of reminisce over and and, and look back on so that's something we're going to be exploring further as well. Um, but going back a slide, talking around the next big issue, like I said, we wanted to go further afield. And <clears throat> there's obviously a lot of talk around the next World Cup and it being in Qatar. Um, and for us, it was like, well, you know, there's a lot of press around the World Cup being Qatar. Um, and so for us, it was a case of, well, you know, why is the World Cup being held there? What is domestic football like there and kind of how is that kind of how is that going to impact the country um so for us that was an opportunity yet again for a story storytelling piece we had no idea what the, what football was like in qatar you know we wanted to see what the league was like what the domestic league was like we knew for example xavi was the, um who's a obviously massive star at barcelona and the spanish national team was coaching one of the top teams there we knew Samuel Eto had, had uh, moved to Qatar and was playing there. And then actually, as we started to delve into it, there was a lot of, you know, superstars that had gone up to Qatar in their career to kind of play. So we were kind of wanted to delve into that. So we, we found the opportunity to go there and actually start to document what was the domestic league there like. You know, we, we got the opportunity to interview Xavi, Eto. What was the you know culture like there? What was how was the World Cup preparations going? And so that for us was a, a big point in terms of moving from a, just a European um, you know base locations to actually now going further afield. But yet again, it was very topical. Um, it allowed us to kind of go further afar, um, and it allowed us to kind of you know see a completely different culture to what we'd seen previously, and actually see you know what what football was like there and, and how it was for fans and and you know a lot of um, in the press in 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 the UK especially were talking around how there was no football um you know culture there and uh, and so for us it was a case of well we'll go and explore it we'll, we want to go and find out uh, what 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 the league's like there and, and and how it how it was progressing so for us that was a big opportunity um and, and one and that we went there in February 2020 so just before the pandemic hit and what that enabled us to do was work on that issue during the very very start of the pandemic and obviously since we we haven't um we haven't been able to travel so we've uh, i can talk a little about how we've evolved as a brand during that time but one thing during that journey as well that we've kind of uh, I've talked about in the new product around city stories and going to Helsinki and documenting an occasion um, and going on to slide 13, thanks Sharon, um, is uh, we were approached by Norwich City Football Club. So like I said, um, I reside in Norwich, I live in Norwich, that is where I was born and that is my team. You know, for me to be able to work with the team I love and have supported all my life was a was a would be a dream come true um and it was something i really wanted to kind of do at some point in my career anyway norwich approached us and were aware of what we were doing and what how we were traveling around and they said look we want we want you to do an issue for us you know glory branded we want you to just do exactly what you're doing but based on our club uh, and being a norwich fan obviously i jumped at the opportunity um you know it enabled us to kind of um not having to travel far we could work directly with our local club and really getting behind the scenes and, and behind that club. And, you know, they, they, during that time that we did this project, it was during the, the season that we got promoted a couple of seasons ago. Obviously, we've been relegated since, um, but we're hopefully going to get promoted again this season. Um, but that for us was another moment in terms of working on a project directly with a football club. And, you know, they wanted no influence on it. They just said, you know, we want you as an outsider publication to come in and document what it is to be a, a Norwich fan and um, and to really capture that in the style that you do it. And for me, that was a kind of moment in terms of, wow, this is a club who are going into the Premier League that really respected what we were doing and loved visually what how we were creating something and wanted to be a part of what we were doing. You know, um, it wasn't a case of us white labeling and doing a Norwich City publication, you know, f for them. 
um, their brand. It was actually our brand and us documenting that club. And they allowed us basically have access all areas, you know, to interview the likes of Timu Puki, I've already mentioned, Todd Cantwell, who's a massive rising star. Um, you know, it gave us a real, real insight. And that was from, you know, historic players and so players. Um, who, who um, were involved in our European run back in 92, 93, um, uh, all the way to the real fundamentals of what makes that Canary culture. And obviously Norwich City are known as the Canaries. So we got to speak to fans, travel to away games and document that whole journey. So for me as a Norwich fan, that was an absolute, you know, uh, massive, uh, massive occasion. And that's something we're looking to explore and expand on as well, is to work with other football clubs and to deliver a very unique product for them. So they sold this in their club shop and online. And the great thing is that at this point, we're suddenly starting to find, you know, avid readers of glory were, were wanting to buy this as well. They weren't even Norwich fans. And this is a whole publication dedicated to Norwich, but they loved what we were doing and they wanted the collection. This is what we've found throughout our whole journey was we've now built a really solid fan base um, and people really collecting the issues, you know, um, we always went into this wanting to create a publication as a keepsake that people could have on their coffee tables or on their um, on their on their bookshelves. So, yeah, another ma massive moment for us and something we're looking to expand on, which kind of leads me on to then the, the kind of I know Sharon touched on it at the start in terms of where we're kind of currently at. So, we've now sold um, uh, issues to sixty-two countries um, across the globe, and this is ultimately word of mouth and social media marketing and the power of social media the football world is 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 very small as soon as you kind of go online and you know as soon as you kind of get a, a you know a bit of standout or you're featured um somewhere it's like a domino effect and this is what we're seeing so you know we've still got a very very strong readership obviously here in the uk where we're based but the rest of the world, you know, 38% of our audience is around the rest of the world, which is which is incredible. We find, I think it's our third, um, Brazil is one of our, is our third biggest country. And, you know, Brazil is known as a massive footballing nation, but that, that's, you know, great insight to us. We've now got 25 stockists of glory across the globe, from New York to Milan to Berlin. Um, we have a... a, a you know, we have a print range of just 2000 issues. You know, we're still a very, very small brand. We're still building that audience. Um, we're still kind of, um, you know, everything, every, every issue sold goes into our next trip and that's how we kind of fund it. And we then rely on kind of partnerships to help, help us travel. Um, but that is where we are. Uh, and th that is the journey. And we've now been doing this for five years. Um, and the, obviously the pandemic's here and we've had to evolve as brand. So, what we've really found now is, um, sorry, I don't know what time is. I've talked quite a bit. Um, so now what we've found is we're evolving. We're now seeing Glory as a lifestyle, not just a magazine. We're now creating a clothing brand to assist people. So wanting to kind of tr travel goods and, and to be a real part of that Glory ethos. So I'll be quiet now because I've spoken for very, very long. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for having the opportunity. I hope you like what you've heard. And um Please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Um, questions, uh, if we if we could, because I'm sure, given that Ryan started his own brand from from nothing, I'm sure there are questions, or you can put them in the chat. Um, Hi, um, Ryan. I actually have a question for you. Um, I was just wondering whether you were ever planning on doing a Sunderland edition um just because my dad is like the biggest fan in the world and I just feel like that would be just throw that out there in case you needed any ideas on what your next edition could be um and also I was just wondering what do you think like the most fundamental principle or principles are when considering how to build such a strong brand like Glory very good question. Firstly, I'll ask answer the Sunderland one. You know, Sunderland's a massive club up in the northeast. We'd love to kind of uh, do a, a, a more club editions. And obviously, if Sunderland were interested in us doing one, absolutely, we'd love to kind of do one. Um, we've been speaking to uh, numerous other clubs um, about doing issues. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. I think if Sunderland uh, want to do Amazing. an issue, they're always open to it. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in terms of the principles around building a brand, I think for me, when starting Glory, it was all around um, having that niche, something, finding something that's going to stand out and not following what others are doing, but, you know, creating something that's going to be different and something that's going to be stand out in, in the space, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the footballing or the magazine world. So I think for us, it was kind of standing to, you know, understanding what that was and building kind of like some brand strategy and some brand principles and then kind of creating, you know, a kind of a deck around that and a, and a strategy around that to go, right, okay. And kind of having the vision in place, you know, I think that's really important. Like, what is the five-year plan? Where do we want to go? And ultimately that will never happen. Like you can always start that journey with going there, but what you'll find is building a brand, it'll take you down so many different avenues. Um, but I think the core, I th going back to your question, I think the core thing is having a very niche kind of proposition. It's having a very strong brand identity. I think that's really key as well. And it's something that represents what you do. Um, but also having the belief in it. I think that is the core. If you've got an idea, a lot of people said to me, why on earth are you starting a publication during a phase where magazines are dying out? And I was, you know, I, you do question it, but then I was like, you know what? I firmly believe in this, that indie publications are on the up and that actually if you produce a, a beautiful publication that's anywhere between a magazine and a book, then people will buy into that. And there's people like me who love that type of product, who want to collect that type of product. So I think it's kind of believing in what you, you, you're you looking to establish and achieve um, and then going with it. You're going to have a lot of people on that journey tell you it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Um, but at the same time, it's like if you fully believe in it and you can kind of back that up in some sense, then my, my advice is just to run with it and see how you go with it. Hopefully no, definitely. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks. I think one of the questions we have here, you've partially answered, which says, given the rise of social media, how do you make hard copy stay relevant and compete with online magazines? It's a really another very, very good question. I think with every edition that we do, um, we try and in, include content that won't date quickly. So we, it's a bit like the mindset of a book, you know. So when we're create, curating content, we're looking at it right is this going to be out of date in a month or so? And if it is, then we go, it's, we, we want somebody to be able to buy this in a year's time, two years time, and it, for, it still to be relevant and it's still to have some relevancy. So I think for, for, for us in that magazine space, I think it's, and, and producing something, you know, um, a physical product, it's around having content that has longevity um and something that's you know somebody can pick up and it's still going to be relevant and um i think that's one of the real important fundamentals behind what we do with glory um and yeah and also like i said about the whole keepsake element you know having something that people can collect and want to have on their bookshelf and share with friends and, and family and we've got one last uh, question here, which is what piece of advice would you give a recent graduate entering marketing for the, that you wish you'd know? Another fantastic question. I think it goes back to that whole, the research element and kind of being one step, trying to be one step ahead of everyone. I think for me, that's kind of been really, really important in terms of my career, in terms of trying to figure out where, where kind of what is the marketing landscape looking like and how can I how can I get that experience before anyone else and get that insight before anyone else and you know there's so much fantastic resources now online um, ar around that so for me going into marketing it's what new technologies what new things are, are coming through in that market and actually starting to kind of understand them and getting ahead with them and, and getting that understanding. And, you know, you can either go in as being a generic marketer or whether you want to go in as being very niche. So, you know, focusing on social media marketing, because obviously that's blowing up massively and growing very, very fast. So, yeah, I think it's a case of 
for me, one thing I've learned and what is 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 doing the research and getting that learning and trying to be one step ahead ahead of everyone else. Great. Um, we're coming up to two o'clock. Um, I'd like to thank Ryan for sharing his journey. One thing I think is fascinating, I think we've had six different talks this, this year and each time one of the things that's really come through is um, about researching, thinking ahead, um, having a vision, uh, which Ryan certainly did, the energy and the dynamism to make it happen. And also something that we journalism tutors go on about a lot, the importance of understanding your audience. And that certainly comes through understanding Ryan's audience of, of people who love football, love photography, love culture. I can't resist this as a last two second question. How much does it cost? So each issue is, is 10 pounds. Um, yeah, plus uh, postage and packaging, obviously. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to, la one last thing, if anyone wants to follow us on social media, um, we're on Instagram, um, at Glory Mag and then underscore. Um, we're, and we're also on Twitter uh, saying uh, Glory Mag underscore. Um, but feel free, uh, my email address is ryan at glorymag.co.uk. Um, Sharon, uh, more than happy to share that afterwards. So if anyone's got any further questions yeah. or anything, please feel free to reach out. Fantastic. I know that um, we'd like to conduct a short interview afterwards, one of our students. Um, I think probably I'll put the two of you in contact because I don't think we can use this Zoom because I have to teach on it. Um, I'd like to thank you and I'd like to thank you all for what has been a fascinating session and uh, look forward to getting in touch about uh, what's, what's, what's happening next. So uh, thank you very much, Ryan. I really look forward to seeing where glory will come, which, uh, which country glory will come as soon as we've finished the pandemic, uh, which hopefully is, is not too far away. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you joining. Thanks.